uh, wanted to talk to you uh, this afternoon about um, say some aspects of, of modelling landscapes, well, landscapes and monuments, uh, as much as landscapes, uh, using using LiDAR data. Uh, I said he'd talk to you about I hope to also demonstrate, uh, in the spirit of some of the talks earlier in the session, uh, actual interactive uh, models, a few of which are currently open on the, on the uh, laptop and eating up large amounts of the system resources. So this first stage may not be as smooth as I would hope, but we'll uh, get on and uh, hope we get there. Let's see how these transitions go. Because that ought to be a slide. I know very slowly indeed. Completely wrong. So much it does. LIDAR. Um, obviously widely used in landscape research, landscape archaeology now, so I hope I don't have to <laughs> explain it in great detail. You know, stick a laser scanner, instrument package, pop in an aeroplane, uh, link it to some GPS uh, uh, locational uh, data on the ground, and uh, come away with uh, large data sets of, of large landscapes of uh, countryside in but in enormous detail. It's the, uh, it's the same thing going forwards. Okay. Of course, an aeroplane isn't the only thing you know, we need an aeroplane at all anymore. Um, here's an example from the latest historic in England a sort of um, archaeological research report newsletter work that John Bedford has been doing. Um, stick a camera up on one of these drone copters these days, use some fancy. Um, Structure from motion photogrammetric modelling, and you don't need laser scanners anymore. You come away with digital terrain models, uh, digital surface models here of Thornton Abbey in North Lincolnshire without resort to uh, laser scanners at all. But um, some of the approaches I'm talking about would really apply to any digital elevation model data set, uh, however it's derived. And I'm still uh, very partial uh, to the, the that's the utility of these LiDAR data sets to plug it because this, you know, this, this very large scale coverage that the Environment Agency have produced uh, over the years, uh, this is a match taken from their website, uh, they now estimate sort of 70% coverage at two meter centres of England and Wales. It looks like rather more in there. It's not all like every square is completely covered. And these are, this is vast, vast quantities of data. Um, at the two meter centre data, there'd be something like 25 billion data points involved in this, this ever growing national data set. In fact, the one meter centre data set, uh, we estimate that at 50% or more of the, of the landscape, we are talking about 75 billion. So in some of the half metre centred, which has so far been more tightly focused on specific areas, and we're, we're looking at a you know, data set of England and Wales, perhaps 100 billion elevation points, covering the vast areas uh, of, of the country, and it's freely available. Now, going back 10 years, it used to take a lot of time, a lot of effort to prize it out of their, their hands, and actually get them to give it to you to, to use, to model a landscape for any sort of research purposes. If you register on their website now, jump through a few hoops to establish that you're not doing anything nefarious and commercial with it, they will effectively give it to you. Uh, and it arrives as ASCII grid files, which can be used in actually all standard sort of GIS packages, including a lot of the free off-the-shelf ones. Uh, all nicely gridded, all nicely on the national grid, um, and able to be tiled together. So there's a, a big data set there. There's a lot of things you can do with it uh, on a landscape scale uh, and more tightly focused. If you want to go further afield, um, Denmark have released their entire national data set of LiDAR coverage. Uh, a bit harder to work with, but you can get it, you can get it online, you can go looking for the landscape of, of Denmark and you know, archaeological earthworks. My first thought on seeing that was oh, quite an interest in archaeological earthworks, linear earthworks, I did wonder about the Daneberg, uh, but it may have been the boundary once upon a time, but it's now all in Germany, so there isn't any data coverage for that. But there are some interesting things that you can find if you prefer to put in the effort. Finland have done the same. You can have a look at the whole of Finland through uh, open access LiDAR data sets. The Netherlands are now releasing uh, uh, their national data sets as well. And if you search, you can find something that's uh, further afield, which I uh, might look at. So there's these quite enormous data sets. Um, 
I combine this landscape scale coverage with really an awful lot of detail. Um, digressing slightly into the landscape, I'm going to come to detailed monuments. Um, this is uh, some work we did with some English Heritage Funding, actually when I worked over in Lincolnshire, Heritage Lincolnshire Archaeological Project Services, mapping the Lincolnshire Fens uh, using the LIDAR data, overlaying with um, Fenland in Roman times, publication about 1970, it was still at the key work of looking at the Roman settlement of the Fens. Um, coloration is fairly standard, sort of terrain colours, modelling the landscape from <coughs> white and blue shades of low line up to green, and then just sort of yellows and, and browns, and uh, showing this landscape of the, of the Lincolnshire Fens. The tidal range in the wash is about plus or minus three metres. Well, Everything in green is at three metres, everything that's in blue and white shades is below the mean high water mark in the wash, even now, never mind um, the change in changing sea levels. Uh, that's the effects of drainage and land reclamation. Roman settlements, big swathe on the, the silt fens, these areas at the fen edge now showing white. That peat fen, drained, deflated, below sea level, a lot of it. Uh, you actually get prehistoric landscapes starting to show through as the peat disappears down edges out here reclaimed uh, marshland awkward zone in the middle where there's marine flood silts overlying it's a difficult landscape to work with but we have this this we use this data set to model the landscape in enormous detail over really quite large areas um, zooming in a bit we go up the uh, Witham Valley um, Strange, strange valley, the, the post-glacial uh, meltwaters carved the Lincoln Gap, if you ever go up to Lincoln, the limestone edge, through the limestone escarpment and then uh, spewed out into this wide valley. The river does a pretty unnatural thing, I mean, it's not natural at all, it's hugging the side of the valley on that side. The other side, this is the Roman Car Dyke, flanking the other side of the valley, but all conventional mapping this flat plain of peak fen in between, except it's not like that at all. My dark data can give us these wonderful views of the past landscape. This is the uh, late Neolithic Bronze Age river system. There's an awful lot of detail in there, just expressed as topography, which the light so they can, can map. I probably feel talk, talking about what's going on here. Um, shall we move on in that direction. Um, Probably a bit more up to date, we'll be doing some work, again, at sort of landscape scale, Trent Valley through Nottinghamshire, starting to look at the tributary systems, it's like a different way, uh, looking at paleo channels, expresses landforms, down the river valley and how they sort of settled down, down the valley. I'm working with this data, well there are, there are various guides to, to doing it now, I mean, uh, Waiting, it's historic England rebranding, but there's still a sort of a, a guide to using the survey uh, by English Heritage. You can some of it, you can find more specific things. Uh, a guide for working with it in ArcGIS, and uh, Keith Chalice will work in the past. You can see a uh, vote just some years ago about the, the suite of techniques that you can use to process this data. And you can do a lot of this stuff, and a lot of the stuff that I'm showing you in. Freely available <coughs> open source software, Saga GIS, QGIS, stuff like that. A lot of see is uh, just using those techniques. Um, perhaps I should uh, I might not come back to this. There are a lot of te techniques for processing and trying to get the most out of the data and trying to understand and see what is there. Thinking today more about presenting that to people in ways that they can understand and some of the techniques or less intuitively obvious in producing maps and plans. The three that I personally find most useful really have been simple hill shading, slope severity, sky view factor. Analytical hill shading is the most intuitive. People look at that, they understand light and shade, and earthworks, this is called the ridge and furrow, and the, well, water meadow systems, and the River Dove, down to Boston and Staffordshire, and um, quite easy to look at easy to understand. It um, can be tricky to work with, going back to this, you do have to be careful of your lighting directions. Some of the uh, foreign here will disappear entirely if you change your direction of illumination. Um, you have to be aware of these things and sort of using, using this. 
but it still produces something that most people can understand. And now flat landscapes slope severity is effectively applying the shading to how steep the slope is. If it's a really steep slope, it's dark. If it's flat, it's, it's light. Uh, in less high relief landscapes, you don't necessarily get as good a representation of the pattern. But in, but in landscapes of higher relief, where you get sort of breaks of slope, even slight breaks of slope show up. I'll show you some examples of that. Sky view factor. Uh, slightly odd one. It's, uh, it's imagining sort of applying shading, dark or light, depending on how much of the sky you can see. Or another way to conceive it really is to think of the whole bowl of the sky as a uniform light source. So if you're down at the bottom of a well, you see the tiny little bit, and that's dark. If you're on the top of a wide open flat plane, you see things which are white, light, and I say it does slightly different things. They all have their different merits. The slope, you can't always tell whether it's a slope up or a slope down. We've got a steep slope and we've got in a flat bit. Is that a bank going up or is it a ditch going down? It looks pretty much the same as that under that mapping, where in fact here you can see that these are ditches parts of the uh, for a system we use as part of the uh, water meadow system and then as a bank. Applying it to something a little different, old serum, and this is just freely available, which I haven't taken let's see uh, LIDAR data, uh, half meter interval data that you can just play with, do what you like. That's the slope severity mapping, that sort of sky view factor. In a plan view, it can be difficult. That's actually the very bottom of the, the moat around the mot, which, uh, because it's flat, there's no slope, but you know, that's the top of the bank, the, the bottom and the top again. It can be harder to see in that. You get to the 3D model, it's somewhat, somewhat easier. Whereas just modeling the steepness of the slope gives you a good, a better representation of that landscape. <laughs> Talk about data sets further afield. There's a little bit of chunk. Ohio, the Great Serpent Mound, the enigmatic uh, mound features, uh, Mississippi, right, Mississippi Valley, and so on. There, the original map was of 1848, and there, uh, it's uh, slope severity model, just a little bit sloped there. And applying a bit of colour, colour ramp, in quite vibrant shades, in contrast to the, <laughs> the sort of landscape. I was using before, but actually quite violent shades can sometimes give you sharp contrasts that you want. Um, I'll go back slightly, quite a wide enough view, but when I was putting all this together I realised that this bank, this overflow channel through here, is actually uh, not more evident as you can put a bit of colour in it. And again, so looking at the Trent Valley, big chunk of the Trent, Trent saw confluence, uh, this just a uh, hill shaded map, which doesn't necessarily tell you quite as much as a hill shaded map with some colour added into it and a natural landscape shades, something a bit more violent. But it does throw up some of the contrasts that cut off meander there, the small ones working here, that's bits of wood and furrow. Uh, to villa sits on this bit of land just above the sort of play, a hill going in the sort of temple ritual site over there. Area. And it's all georeferenced data. You can do lots of things with it. Here's the landscape of the River Nee at Water Newton. Uh, this is the Roman town. Here's the Roman road. Nice earthwork feature running all the way through. Interesting mounds out there. You can <coughs> drop other things onto it. You can drop your air photograph, your air photographic plots onto there. And start to sort of look at these, these monuments in there. Landscape setting, you can understand the landscape. Uh, I have time to go through this. I should get a whole series of slides of, of Silchester um, out so here, just with some slope severity. You can see some elements of the town. Actually, that's where the forum is. It's showing up as a slight bump. Uh, at least one of those seems to match a Roman road, but only one of them doesn't. In a strange way, that's the University of Reading excavations, and they're spoiling, spoiling immediately adjacent. <laughs> Things onto it like the uh, 1909 site of Mount Cruise plant, and their series of excavations in the early, the early 20th century. Uh, take that off, but some of the later, later mapping over the top, the more recent uh, photographic 
maps. Outside the walls. Probably shady. Get to get to three D, three D models. Here, using a bit of the sky view factor plot. So the sky view factor. I quite like it aesthetically in some ways. It produces this uh, odd effect of almost a 360 degree shadow around trees because obviously you're standing next to a tree. You can't see quite as much of the sky as if you are standing somewhere else. And, uh, and you uh, see only parts of it, but that's a Plans. Something from rather closer by, uh, care went. Um, I really got to try and find out. There's, there's um, 25 centimeter data coverage that the Environment Agency have done. They must have done it for somebody. They don't usually do this uh, as part of their standard suite of, of mapping for, for, for flood risk. But there's a very detailed data set just available. It's just there. Um, care went and we just went away and you can see the detail of the task. In fact, the, Structures that are exposed, the wall lines are all, are all in there. That is the slope to begin with. That's using the sky view factor modeling input. Well, a strong and vibrant color scheme, in, which is perhaps a little bit too much, but it does clearly sort of show areas of high ground, that ground moving the walls, built up to the land to our side, and again, able to get three dimensional views. Quite close in, you can get this is, yeah, this is just the large agency stuff. It's just there. That's where it's not got it. Or you can go to Avebury, around to Silvery Hill. This is all just off the shelf LIDAR, LIDAR data processed using these these really available open source bits of software. I, I did try and do a bit of Finland. I don't understand anything about Finnish archaeology. This is um, supposed to be a hill fort that doesn't really seem to surround the top of the hill. Uh, it's, um, it's a medieval, <coughs> which was associated with uh, the town down there, which was completely filtered out in, in this data set. There. And there's the great servant mound again. But those are all very well. I hope you like some of the NI views that we come up with. We spent a bit of time thinking about the, the shading and which sort of uh, uh, elements to uh, uh, whether the slope severity and how you model it and whether you apply colour were the best way of, uh, of getting <coughs> information out of it. But as we were talking about area, that's 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 <laughs> okay. There is obviously there's the art in choosing your view and presenting it to people, but people do like to to see things that they can play with and move around. And there are some ways of doing that now which are reasonably straightforward. Um, QGIS, that, um, that I was using to produce some of those, there's a plugin that somebody has produced for it, which just uh, almost at the press of a button, well, once you've decided on your, your texture and your colour schemes, will create something that you can just stop, stick on a web page, just like that. There we go, and we can, we can zoom and pan, and this is Maryport. Uh, the Roman fort out of Mary Port, just ported directly out of QGIS in, to be honest, uh, in a matter of minutes, really, once you've got it all set up and installed. Um, this one, this is from that uh, Danish data set. This is a, a Viking ring fortress, again, just sort of taken from some of the, the freely available uh, landscape data and now responding. <coughs> Uh, slowly, actually, I, I thought to myself, oh, yeah, I should close these as I finish with them, and I might actually free up enough system resources to get to the end of this without it all grinding to a halt. But again, there's an, there's just a zoom and pan. You can just zoom and pan and go around, explore the strange class of, of monuments. There's a uh, Three or four of them that survive reasonably well. Uh, one or two of them have disappeared beneath, beneath towns, but um, spent a bit of time working your way around these uh, data sets of the Danish landscape. Come by them. Oh, it's checking me out. Let's look at that one then. Thinks about it. Tell them for about 10 minutes, they might take 10 minutes to get these to respond at this rate. <laughs> uh, 
or oh, I've crashed Firefox. Again, that's um, fairly yeah, straightforward to do. Uh, anyway, sort of just coming out of some of these sort of free bits of software. But um, another thing, this will open. I've come across recently in another context is the ability of PDF format to actually support 3D models and 3D modeling. So, except that I've clearly overloaded the system resources to demonstrate this. This is not quite so easy to do. There's a company that sells, that sells this software. Um, since a lot of the examples that they produce and that came with it are engineering components, I imagine that they're, they're target market is uh, something that would um, support a rather higher pricing level than perhaps uh, this, this would. But this is a PDF document. It's not even a particularly large PDF document. It's a 1.5 megabytes. It's quite flat. Uh, uh, seems to be uh, eating up the system resources. But here's the model of Silvery Hill again. Uh, you can send this uh, off to someone, and it's just a 3D model which they can, which they can zoom and pan find their way around. You can design in Photoshop. Yeah, they will write these things now. Yeah, this is, uh, so this is, yeah, Agisoft does it, which that um, structure of motion um, photogrammetry stuff with, with photographs allows you to do, but Agisoft is quite expensive. Um, I did ask these sort of options, lighting schemes, uh, lights, it's quite interesting colour scheme. Sorts of tools and menus that you can add, add to this to allow you to do uh, various things. Um, it's people who produce it. It's the rather functionally named PDF, uh, PDF 3D Report Gen. Report Gen, I think. But um, so I tried to get them to give me some indication of <laughs> their pricing. It didn't, uh, didn't really come to anything. But um, it will allow you to do that. I'll get into this one, without it, coming back out of here, but sticking back a lot. What does that monument look like from the ground? Well, that one, it, has, it is actually surrounded by trees and um, vegetation. That model has had sort of vegetation stripped I mean, out of it. What was the designer wanting that monument to do? Well, we don't entirely know. It's, it's called the Great Serpent Man. It's a serpent <laughs> devouring an egg. Um, but you know, I mean, we, we can see it as an extraordinary, you know, <laughs> yes. piece of landscape art. Mm. But that's because we're sitting in an aeroplane. But presumably, <laughs> the, the designer didn't have that view in mind. No. Uh, so yes, a strange enigmatic thing. I mean, everything from the Nazca lines to the marching bears national park. Again, there's, there's a series of, of mounds in the Mississippi Valley just in the like from the air, look like a series of bears following each other in a <laughs> line across the hillside. You know, how they were intended to be to be seen, how they were planned, is a uh, matter entirely. Right, we, we may just end up with <laughs> not responding as the uh, default response here. But if we get there, this was just to demonstrate a different set of controls. It's one of the other things we can, we can do with this. We can, Use a model that actually has a control. You can control the vertical exaggeration, sort of, uh, and to be within the model. There's old sound again. What did you say the final statement? 1.5 megabytes. PDF. That's, that's all. It's not a very, it's not a very detailed model. The meshes for this are actually reduced down to something like 500 by 500. The texture is a lot more detailed, but the if we zoom in really close, we're probably not going to uh, see. You're not going to get much more detail than that. Really zooming really close. This, let's say, from the other controls you can do, we can. <coughs> so it uh, follows me 
a long <coughs> eventually actually you know, just adjust the the Z scaling interactively. <laughs> The other aspect, the other aspect of this, which I not like, is that they can just be in, inserted into a document as an illustration. Um, you know, there's, a, there's loads. This is just a, a PDF page. It's just an illustration. You can rotate it, move it around, look at it. You can print out the page with the view that you have chosen. And it's all. Yeah, yeah. It does actually do that. It does. Yes. Uh, but <laughs> it's great when it works. Yes, so I might just leave it there. Oh, great! Works. There we go. So I won't try changing the scale of that page so we can see all of it. But no, it's just a front page of a report that sort of just embedded into it is a is a, a, a model that you can just just move uh, move around and have a look. Uh, I get it right. Zoom in. Chuck of the chuck of the Trek Valley again, Roman's site at Little Bra, Roman Road, coming down, crossing the valley. Uh, so yes, interactively allowing somebody to mess up the page design, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> perhaps uh just wait in the future. But to uh, stop there before it all grinds a complete halt. Hope that you enjoyed some of that. And uh, say so, uh, on with a lot of data that's just out there waiting to be be used in various ways. Thank you. Thank you.